my family bought me a little mini fridge because I, I, I've always been talking about you haven't really got an office until you've got champagne in a fridge at the back of the office sort of thing. So it's something that really surprised me. I haven't, I, I did, I've done a little bit of wine tasting and wine course and stuff like that. And the thing that amazed me was the difference in a red between when you open it and a few hours later or even the next day and the temperature. So the, the, your memory and enjoyment of the wine is so dictated to by the conditions. And, and yet you think, oh, every bottle's the same, but actually it's how you serve it, treat it. It makes a big difference, yeah. As well as what you eat with it as well, of course. That makes it, like you, you'll be drinking it, then you'll, exactly, then you eat something and go, this wine tastes like a different wine. It's when you hold your nose and taste something as well, because so much of it is, so much of it is on the aroma, isn't it? That it just, yeah. You can almost hardly taste anything if you take out the aroma. Yeah, so, so the wine that we're drinking, um, yes. <laughs> just segue into that. Oh, we should open really it, shouldn't we? So put yes. it into camera. Yes. There we go. There okay, we go. Beautiful so, label, by the way. I love it. Um, and it, it's sort of, it looks very like nice a done. wood grain. Um, so I'll translate yeah, for people yeah. while you're opening that perhaps. Okay, so this is uh, not pronounced Billy Cart Salmon. <laughs> I mean, if you want to be French Billy and wanky, salmon, yeah. um, it's Bicar Salmon um in french and this is a really interesting house it's um it's privately owned so it's not part of the big other conglomerates which are perrier lvmh and there's another one um lens on bcc it is which own most of the brands that yeah. you know of champagne so this is a private company uh, family owned uh, very well known for a cool fresher sort of style of champagne mm -hmm. so they in their their nv which is the black label ones you may have seen uh around that sort of uh, 40 quid you mark for, you ready for pop yeah, go for it. Okay. There, that's that's what we were hoping for, isn't it? There, there, that beautiful smart. sound. Yes. So thanks for coming on the Cheers show. Cameron. And um, yeah, really absolute good pleasure. There we go. Cheers. You too. Ching ching. ching, ching. Right, let's give this a go. Okay, so while you're sipping, I want to see what you think. But uh, this is uh, so sorry. I was talking about the Billy Cart um, NV, which is the non-vintage version, which you see the black label and silver. Um, really nice, very high Pinot Meunier, which is the cool fruit sort of uh, Pinot, one of the three grapes. This is actually an even split between the three grapes. So Pinot Meunier, Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay. So 33, 33, 33. And uh, this one is actually vinified in wood, hence the term sous-bois or S-O-U-S-B-O-I-S -S at the bottom. Um, so that means it's vinified in the oak cask. Normally champagne is vinified or fermented in big stainless steel vats which you'd normally see at most breweries right or wineries um and then depending on the house they might put it in some after it's like fermented and everything they might put it in some casks or big barracks which are massive barrels which you know hold thousands of liters which is what verve clinko does and, and imparts a bit of a sort of wet woody sort of taste and sort of creaminess to it but this one is vinified or fermented in the barrels themselves which is very risky um because you need to control that and um you impart a lot of oak flavor it can be quite dominating kind of like a red wine um and but the, the bika uh someone are, are so good at this that it imparts this richer deeper taste that i think is quite moorish and vanilla tones are coming through and sugar and it's just like amazing and they use the best quality grapes You're in the best right. areas yeah the woody um, vanilla and it's funny because yeah. i remember you said to me you know pick a champagne and, and my mm -hmm. default will be bollinger and yes. actually, it feels very close to that. It, yes, it, yes, it's, yes. It's, it's, uh, you, you got it. You nailed it in terms yep. of an alternative to Bollinger that's Bollin in that sort of um That same that realm, but Bollinger um, yeah. also do a lot of maturation and casks. So they store the, the still wine in, in oak casks, in small oak barrels, by the way, not the big barracks, which is what Verve does. So you get a lot more oak contact. And this is like next level again, which is like actually fermenting in the barrels and storing in the barrels. Um, so... Um, but I just think it's it's this dichotomy of like lightness and freshness, but also I call it a man's champagne because it's deep and rich and luscious. Um, You're right, actually. It's got it's got it's got a lot of flavour, but it's also light. It's not he it's not heavy. It's it's easy to drink, but you get a lot from. It's it's actually my favourite um, white wines. It, I'd probably go Italy if I were to pick someone like a Greco de Tufo or a Garvey de Garvey. What you get is the same thing. They're, they're still they're still very easy to drink and light, but you just get a lot of flavour. Um, rather than a Pinot Grigio, which would just be like, you know, almost like water sort of thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just, it's just, it's almost like, yeah, wa alcoholic water sort of thing. But, but I love, I love the, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm glad you enjoy it. But, um, but on another note, um, you were talking, um, and Bernard br brought this up on Twitter the other day. Um, people don't believe um, our, our conversation around 
using a minimal budget and you wrote a, a piece, I think, was it on Medium recently or something around? Marketing Week. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, that's right. So yeah, so Market Marketing Week asked me to uh, to draw a little piece on what do you do when you have no budget? Because uh, the reason for it is I, I do webinars all the time, events, speaking, all that kind of thing. And whenever you talk about the marketing science, most people say, well, that's great if only I had a big budget, right? <laughs> what, what do you do if you don't have a big budget? And I, I have genuinely, I, I mean, I know I'm sort of known for something else now, but most of my career, I have been working on smaller brands, challenger brands and so on. Now, you know, budgets vary, right? So I've worked on almost no budget and I've worked on big budgets, nothing in between. So an unusually varied career from that point of view. And I, I firmly believe that, all, that the best work happens when you have serious constraints because you have no choice but to be creative. So um, when I was chatting to Russell at Marketing Week, and we were chatting about topics. I said, well, let's talk about having no budget. And he, he loved it. So he's, anyway, so he commissioned the piece. Um, Bernard Blessing uh, was calling me out on Twitter uh, on the basis that... So, so the two examples I gave, just, just to explain the two examples in the article. So one was Lipton iced tea, where uh, in the UK, people don't like cold tea, right? It's a cultural thing. We drink our tea hot, right? It's a very American, Southern American thing, iced tea, isn't it? Yeah, it is, isn't it? But actually, the funny thing is, when people try iced tea in the UK, they love it. So you've got this massive difference between perception, it's going to taste horrible. I, why would I have cold tea? It's literally, oh. And then the reality is, oh, that's really nice. Um, and, and anyway, so I gave the example of a, a three-year campaign I ran. I doubled the sales of the brand. And the only thing we did was sampling. And we started off in a micro center of London, experimental, you know, it literally was four postcodes, right? We just wanted to prove if it worked. We went round to the shops and we, you know, we, we found out the difference in sales before and after we did the sampling in the area. And we worked out, we, you know, we, in most cases, we were sort of doubling sales in the areas we were going to. And I was like, wow, this really does work. And so I just um, used that as proof of concept, scaled it up. But the point of that was focus on the one thing that makes a difference because you don't have the luxury of throwing everything at it. The second example um, was this augmented reality packaging um, where I'd spent, now my budget, just just for listeners, was £100,000, right? But on production and design of the new, of the brand relaunch, I had no media spend. So I did this partnership with an AR company, turned the packaging into media. And what was interesting about it is in the first 12 months, we had 300,000 interactions with our brand. And it was an amazing thing to demo to customers. And it, and off, we, we won lots of listings and uh, we got lots of PR, we won awards, et cetera, et cetera. So it really built fame for the brand and the awareness of the brand doubled in those 12 months with no media budget. So it was it was a very, it was basically leveraging, you know, our own packaging as media. Now, Bernard, bless him, uh, kind of called me out on it and said, you don't know what a tiny budget is. <laughs> okay, in his defense, yes. in his defense, you do work for larger brands now and a larger sort of uh, yeah. a, a company that which you know looks at larger brands so i can see why he would make that assertion and you know what to be honest i probably would have made that before i interviewed you and, yeah. and looked at you and saw your progression i was like actually yeah. john's done both here which is why i want to interview exactly you in the I first know, place I so know. i can see he would make the same and, mistake but yeah, yeah sorry, and, and to, to be you. honest i would do the same right so I, I, and and which made me smile so it's the sort of thing i would probably want to call out as well go yeah 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 yeah, yeah. come on <laughs> yeah you're pulling the wool over our eyes you haven't really had a small budget anyway so i replied and said well yeah. how about spending 350 pounds and generating 750 thousand pounds sort of thing which he called bullshit so um <laughs> the problem with Twitter is you can't really explain something like that, right? So how the hell did that happen? No. So I, th this is my opportunity to obviously quickly explain. Now, it does require a little bit of context, but I think hopefully what anyone listening will see in this is it's about leveraging all the levers at your disposal. So this is what happened, right? Mm -hmm. So I was working, this is um, after I'd done the launch of the Juice brand with the Augmented Reality. So that was the, that was the brand I was managing. Mm -hmm. Now, in the UK, this is a few years ago, the government introduced new legislation about what kids could drink in schools. They, they really tightened up what drinks were available. They wanted to reduce sugar, reduce portion sizes, make healthier offerings and tackle obesity. Now, the advantage with the, with the brand I was managing is we owned our own factory in production. So it was only a 12 million pound company, fairly small, but we owned, you know, we, we basically owned production, which meant we had flexibility, we could do things quickly, which is great. So I set myself the challenge 
to be the first to market with a schools approved, legally schools approved drink. Because basically I thought if I could get this to market first, I, I literally have got a free reign at getting into every school in the country. It's like, it's like, yeah. it's like that Mad Men um, thing, you know, the, 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 the cigarettes. Oh, it's an opportunity. You know, yeah. you could say it's anything you want. Yeah. It's toasted. You yeah. Know? Like, so you had this opportunity That's of like, right. let's first yeah. move your advantage. Like, That's let's right. brand this. And, and I, 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 you know, there are elements of luck that always happen in these stories. I happened to be invited onto the government consultation. And on the government consultation were the 10 largest soft drink manufacturers in the UK giving their response to legislation. And I, I was listening in. Every single one of them was trying to fight the legislation rather than work with it. They're all going, well, there's no way we could change our production lines over. There's, that's way too short a time to implement you know, the packaging changes and you know, formulation changes. I'm sat there going, my competitors have just basically announced that they're not going to be like playing ball with the governments. If I'm the one that... So, and, so they weren't vertically integrated like you. So they would have outsourced to a distribution or a bottling firm or... Well, no, they would. No, no, they, they, they would. So, so these are the biggest. Yes. This is like Coke yeah. and Pepsi and Suntory. These are the big ones. They've got loads of manufacturing capability. The issue in a big company is when you've got Pepsi going down your production line, you're not going to stop it, switch so over for a, and reduce the pack and change the formulation and produce something very bespoke the government's asked mm. for for schools... It's just not worth your time. Whereas me, as a small manufacturer that happened to have uh, our own, we had one, you know, one sort of advanced mm. reflection line. I thought, oh, I could, I could do what they want. Actually, I, I, what they're asking is possible. And what I worked out is I could do it in about sixteen weeks, which in MPD big manufacturing sure. terms is yes. just insanely quick. Yeah. So, so, so the context was that, right? So I was basically first to market in the UK with a new government approved drink, right? So that's the context. Now, the biggest supplier mm -hmm. to schools in the UK is a company called Compass. And they are, I mean, they're global, they, are, you know, they employ 60, 70,000 people. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're almost like the size of a small country that they're, they're just a massive organization. Now, I went obviously later that year to pitch Big, uh, to obviously trying to get into the most amount of schools and I lost the pitch big time in fact I, I was nowhere near getting close to winning the pitch and in the feedback they said look your pricing is like almost twice what we're getting from the major suppliers now by this point the major suppliers had started to follow suit and produce uh, approved ranges um, so I thought damn what do I do I mean like, I, I've got I've got no chance of competing here um, anyway next bit of luck they then approached. Uh, they then approached me and said, "We've got an annual uh, sell-in day, right? Basically, where all suppliers could go and pitch their idea for the next for the following year. And it's a bit like okay. a dragon's den that you basically each supplier gets half an hour in front of the board, and then you basically now. Now we weren't a supplier, by the way. We we'd only been on board as a supplier for this procurement process. So technically, we weren't supplying anything, but we were on the kind of long list of potential suppliers. Um, now, there's one other important inf bit of information that will explain why this idea works so well. So in, uh, it's not enough to get a listing from this big organization because when you get a listing, you're on the list of approved mm -hmm. drinks. You then have to go around each school and you have to sell in your drink but at wow. each school level. So it's like um, the stage yep. one is get on the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now bear in mind, we were a 12 million pound company. We, I think our sales team were probably eight or 10 people max, right? So we, and they're, they're dealing with national contracts. We don't have a field sales force. We have, we employ nobody to go out there and <laughs> like actually go door to door. Not you know constraint. what I mean? It's just like, yeah. that would cost us a yeah. fortune. Yeah. yeah, massive constraint. Anyway, so I, I came up with this idea. Um, the idea was called the Juice Burst Entrepreneurs Program. And the idea was this, I pitched them and only 30 minutes, I said, the biggest thing I can do is help students learn the art of business. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically create a competition across all your schools to find the most entrepreneurial team that can manage the fridge in the canteen. What they have to do, they have to order the stock. They have to manage the, you know, how it's laid out. They have to organize promotions. They have to decide the pricing. They manage the inventory. The school that sells the most juice burst per capita mm -hmm. You know, in terms of per, you know, per per pupil, will get the opportunity to come to our factory and design their own drink for the wow. following for the following school year. They'll design the flavor, they'll design the label. You know, they'll they'll get to promote it. They'll, they'll be able to sign the back of the. You know, they'll be able to sign it. We'll do some press, that sort of thing. 
So basically, I created this scheme where um, each school competed to find mm. students who, as part of their learning experience, were going to manage the marketing of the drinks in the canteen. And they had to, they had to think about promotion. They had to think mm. about basically all the peaks, right? They had to think about wh where it's placed. Had to think about how they promote it, how they sample it, how they you know drive word about how much do they how much they stock, where, how do they price it, how, which mm. flavors are going to do best, and how do you you know put it on the shelf. So this is the idea. So when it, so media budget, I had no media budget, right? So what did I do? So I I spent three hundred fifty pounds employing a cameraman uh, to film me in the factory, right? So basically I produced a little film where I said, hi, it's John here from Juice Burst. I've got a challenge for every school up and down the country. I want you, and I basically created this email address, which was kind of entrepreneur scheme at Juice Burst, blah, blah, blah. And I said, write to me at this email address and, and basically tell me who's on your team. I will send you a pack of my guide to how to win in soft, you know, how to build a soft drink category and how to sell soft drinks, that sort of thing. I will send you a kit that will tell you how to do it. And there'll be a competition. The winning team will get to come to uh, this factory where I am now on this production line. And you will see your drink going down the line with your name on it this time next year sort of thing. And um, what was amazing about it is, so I pitched this idea and then I heard nothing. So absolutely nothing, right? And um, oh, mm -hmm. I heard nothing, right? And then what happened next is I got this, I got this email going, would you come and present to Iron Your Conference? I'm like, yeah, present what? And then the, the director of this company said, no, we'd like to present the entrepreneur scheme that you pitched to us. I'm like, oh, we're going ahead, are we? He said, didn't you know that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've selected it as the number one initiative for our school's division for next year. And I'm like, oh, great. And then I said, and, and then so anyway, so I ended up on stage presenting to the entire like division within that company, or the, this entrepreneur scheme. And they're all clapping and applauding and go, this is amazing. We're going to really get behind this. And they announced that it would start in three weeks time. I wasn't even a supplier. We hadn't got pricing. We hadn't got anything. Anyway, so I then went to their logistics team and said, how do I get you all the stock for all the schools and get all this done? Anyway, um, I ended up listing um, Juice Burst at mm -hmm. full price at twice the price that the competitor had won the pitch six months earlier with no promotional discounts, no listing fees, no nothing, because they were so sold by this idea that they were going to promote it and they were going to force distribution, which is unusual. So they were going wow. to basically allocate a certain amount of stock to every school in the country to give yes. them a kickstart on this, on this competition. So um, all I had to do was film myself doing this promotional video, send it to them. They distributed it to all their schools. And then basically from that point in the first year, we sold £750,000 of products just based wow. on that one idea. And it was in, in fact, a year later, Grace and I, Grace was the account manager. Grace and I got an award from the whole company and it was the employability award for our biggest contribution to uh, employment prospects for kids up wow. and down the country because they love this idea so much that a supplier would. Now, what I realized, what I learned from that is, of course, you know, the creativity was great. It was a lovely idea. It fixed a problem of what do you do when you have no sales team? I can't go into schools mm -hmm. and do it. Let's get the kids to do it. Right. So that was the basic idea. But what I didn't realize and what really worked for the customer is Compass themselves, they compete with other suppliers to schools. They were using this as a reason for them to be the nominated supplier uh -huh. over other suppliers to the school. So they're going, well, look at the value that we add. You know, we don't just provide drinks, education. we provide yeah, education yeah. opportunities and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't quite realize they were using it as a big yep. PR exercise for their own marketing. So, I mean, you look at that, I mean, then, you know, I, I learned so much there in terms of, you know, aligning what you do to the customer's objectives. What can make them look good? You know, again, the person that ran that division was, you know, proudly talks about what we're doing for the whole year and, and how so it's you're the selling, thing they're going to do. You're selling but political use, capital and yeah, also creating distribution network effects, basically, within buy-in, with all yeah. these layers within yeah. in the network, right? Yeah, it, it's it's good. That's it. Yeah, yeah. To yeah, totally. And 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 what I'm doing, I'm leveraging what I've got, and what I've got is I've got factory production, right? What can I give away that no one else can? I know Coke, Pepsi, big companies. Yeah. They're not going to invite some school kids to go and make a drink <laughs> on their production line. They never do that, right? That would cost millions for them to turn yeah. the switch off. You know what I mean? But I was able to because I, I I oversaw what we you know what end of, you know what mm -hmm. new products we made and how we made them. I had 
loads of drinks on development at any one time. It's easy for me to go, well, look, here's our lab. Here's all the different flavors we got. Go and play with those. Here's, here's my designer who does the labels. You know, go and play about with it and so on. So I was able to leverage something that I had, uh, that I owned. I mean, I didn't personally own it, but in terms of it was available to me. But I was able to use it to solve the big problem, which is how do you get distribution yeah. in schools when you don't have a sales team, you know, sort of thing. So, wow. yeah, so I, I don't know if it qualifies for Bernard, but basically the spend, I actually spent £350 <laughs> marketing. Uh, but of course it was, it, but the, the idea and that £350 was enough to convince the biggest food service company in the world to take an unknown, an unknown drinks brand and push it into every, every school in the country. Which is an and at a price twice the competition. Well, maintaining we're margins, yeah, which is large, large. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so exactly. So it was high margin. It was guaranteed sales. It was mega engagement with kids. It was you know free promotion, and the only actual spend was. Uh, That's what I call a profitable pounds. marketing campaign if I've ever seen one. I don't know whether it's. I don't know whether it qualifies <laughs> enough, but um, you know, I mean, you know, but I think that the point is when you when when you're in a small business, you cannot just do one of the P's. You, everything has to play back for everything else. So you have to think, how can my label be media? How can my product development be uh, distribution? How can my salespeople be also PR? You know, how do our HR policies turn into, you know... And what, what is our, what is our unique competitive so factor everything. that our competitors don't have? Like you said, you have flexibility, yeah. you had, yeah. um, you know, yeah. resources exactly. that they wouldn't be able to have access to. So, yeah, no, I love it. Um, yeah. no, that's a really good yeah. story. Um, well, it's yeah. also true. Yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, there you go. No, it is. And yeah, I, 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 where the idea came from, so I, I was interviewing Kev Chesters for a uh, podcast on creativity. And in advance of it, I wrote down my five most creative campaigns right and what i realized is that by the way i put as number one because i think in terms of business results so. for one idea that led to big business results, i thought that's pretty hard to beat in my own career um the top four were all like that they were all limited they were all less than a hundred thousand they were all kind of modest yep. small budgets and only the fifth one came to a budget that was more than six figures wow. so it, it, it I, I think it's i think when you have a constraint you have to think much more creatively and i think that was the inspiration for the that's, awesome. that's great um well thanks for sharing your story i really appreciate it and uh, enjoy the champagne yeah, yeah. my pleasure yeah thanks mate <laughs> yeah, you good, too. To, good to see you until until next time